I think we can jump right in. It's six o'clock and folks will be joining us as we go. Well, great. Well, good evening, folks. My name is Jody Hill. I have the great privilege and honor of serving as president of Memphis Theological Seminary. We are truly excited to have our wonderful panelists this evening, Dr. Melanie Harris, Dr. Christopher Carter, as we uh, share in the great fruit of their leadership, their intellect and wisdom on ec ecological justice and the many ways that we can uh, more fruitfully serve this beautiful world that God has gifted us with. And uh, we are pleased that you are joining us tonight. We are blessed to be part of your academic and theological and spiritual journey here at Memphis Theological Seminary. And we pray that each of you will feel welcome and be renewed as we grow together this evening to this wonderful discussion. And as we prepare to start this night, let us petition the Holy Spirit for grace and guidance as we discern together. Would you join with me in prayer? Oh God, we are grateful for this gift of prayer that we share in community with one another and with you, where we lift up together joys and concerns, where we share struggles, sorrows, celebrations, laughter, and love. We're grateful for the gifts that you've equipped your faithful intellects with as we discern together ways that you can mold us and make us more in your image through your love, O oh God, and for your glory. Will you guide us this evening with your uh, still small voice, O oh Spirit, as you comfort us and convict us, as you correct us and as you nurture us. And all the while, may our discernments lead to actions that we live out our faith in ways that reflect your love, your justice, your scholarship and piety as we embody these great tenets of our faith in Memphis Theological Seminary. We pray your holy blessing on all of our students that we serve and all those we serve with, our faculty, our staff, our trustees, our alumni and benefactors. Would you, O oh God, come and be with us this night, illuminating us to your word and the wisdom of our professors, that as we go from this place, we may be made more in your image for your glory. In Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. And now it's my great pleasure to toss it to our wonderful Dean and Vice President of Academic Affairs, Dr. Peter Gatke. Thank you, Dr. Hill. I am going to do a short introduction to the Holmes Todd Lectures. So these lectures combine two of the lecture series at Memphis Theological Seminary in order to honor both Dr. Barbara Holmes, Dr. Virgil Todd, and his lifelong partner, Irene. Dr. Virgil Todd became a faculty member of the Cumberland Presbyterian Seminary at Bethel College back in 1954. He was among the Magnificent Seven who helped to organize and make the move of the seminary to Memphis in 1964 as Freedom Summer was underway in the civil rights movement in Mississippi. Dr. Todd served as professor at MTS through 1986. He was also moderator of the Cumberland Presbyterian Church, and he was one of many MTS faculty and alumni to serve in that position. Dr. Todd's lifelong partner, Irene, also served for many years as the assistant to the president. Together, the Todds were at the heart of Memphis Theological Seminary for well over 30 years. Dr. Barbara Holmes was professor of Christian ethics and African-American studies at Memphis Theological Seminary from 1998 to 2010. In 2005, Dr. Holmes became the first African-American woman in the United States to become vice president of academic affairs and dean at a seminary when she was appointed to that position here at Memphis Theological Seminary. Dr. Holmes retired from MTS in 2010 and then served as president of United Theological Seminary in the Twin Cities from 2012 to 2016. She continues her engagement in scholarship, piety and justice, stating, my life is committed to the struggle for justice the healing of the human spirit, 
and the art of relevant and radical creativity. I'm delighted to welcome you all to the 2023 Holmes Todd Lectures. And now I turn it off over to soon to be Dr. Ferris Blunt. Thanks so much, Dean Gatke, so, so much for the introduction. And again, welcome to everyone. So glad for you here this evening. My name is Ferris Blunt, and I'm Assistant Professor of Theology here at MTS uh, in Memphis, Tennessee. And I'm going to be your MC, if you will, for this evening. So I'll walk us through what the goal is, the plan is for, for tonight. I first will introduce our speakers. I'll introduce Dr. Carter and then Dr. Harris, who after I introduce each of them separately, they'll have a short talk in which they'll engage us with. And following their, their short talks, their brief introductions and opening statements, they'll have a conversation. I find their conversation will open up to Q&A from the audience. And so all of you here on Zoom, there should be a Q&A feature that you can begin to as they begin speaking here shortly. Uh, drop your questions there. So by the the end of our conversation tonight, they would engage in dialogue with the questions you're all posing to them. So right now, though, I want to go ahead and introduce Dr. Carter and then turn the floor over to him for his opening statements in his talk this evening. So Reverend Dr. Christopher Carter's research, teaching, and activist interest are in Black womanist and environmental ethics, with particular focus on race, food, and non-human animals. His publications include The Spirit of Soul Food, Blood in the Soil, The Racial, Racist, and Religious Dimensions in Environmentalism, in the Bloomsbury Handbook of Religion and Nature, and the co-edited volume, The Future of Meat Without Animals. In them, he explores the intersectional oppressions experienced by people of color, non-human nature, and animals. Currently, he is an associate professor of theology at the University of San Diego, lead pastor of the loft at Westwood United Methodist Church, and is also on the board of directors of Farm Forward, an anti-factory farming nonprofit. So without further ado, I want to turn it over to Dr. Christopher Carter, Reverend Dr. Christopher Carter. Welcome so much, and thank you so much. I know I have to put all those titles in there because all that school I did, man. Like, you know, <laughs> I need <laughs> everybody to know. <laughs> and uh, in my denom I mean, I'm a Methodist, so in my denomination, you basically go through a tenure process to get ordained, a tenure process to become an associate professor. So um, I, it's important for me to claim them. I'm going to start my timer now so I can track my time and make sure I am on time. Um, so let me go ahead and do that. Uh, I want to thank you all for having me uh, here um, and just the opportunity to share this space and be in conversation with Dr. Harris and with you all. Um, it's just really an honor and a privilege. Um, she knows how much I value her work and how much her work has influenced my work um, by the simple fact that um, I cite her work so much in my own. So, <laughs> um, so it's just an honor and a privilege. Uh, I am going to share my screen here. Oh, I think I, I'm sorry. We should have checked on that. But says so. If someone can enable my screen sharing, that would be great. Um, let me see. There we go. Perfect. Thank you so much. And let me get to that. Perfect. When I became an adult, my maternal grandfather, a naturally introverted man, very fairly quiet, he opened up and began to share stories from his childhood growing up in Brookhaven, Mississippi. Stories of working in the fields as a child, of only going to school a few months a year between the ages of six to 10, and becoming a migrant picker when he was 11. As a young adult, he was the lead farmhand for a white farmer, but he had been saving money to buy land to start his own farm. In my grandfather's pithy style, he told me that on one night, he told the man that he was working, oh, he told the man he was working for, that he was planning on leaving in a few months to start his own farm. The man tried to talk my grandfather out of it. And once uh, the white man realized he couldn't talk my grandfather out of it, he looked at my grandfather dead in the eye and told him that if he wasn't going to be working for him, he wouldn't be working for anyone. Knowing a death threat when he heard one, my grandfather fled to Michigan, where my family currently resides. His stories struck something in me. And that I think is why my academic and active, or one reason I should say, why my academic and active, activist work center on religion in ecology, and why I focus so much of my work on agriculture, dehumanization, race, and class. But in truth, I didn't know the magnitude of my grandfather's influence upon me until I was defending my dissertation. As is common, I was allowed to give the opening remarks for my defense and describe my project to those loving souls who attended. I began my defense by talking about my grandfather. I started to share how his stories shaped my work 
And then a very peculiar thing happened. I began to weep. Tears welled up in my eyes and they fell uncontrollably from my face. My advisors, my friends, everyone was taken aback. In that moment, I was struck by the immensity of what I had accomplished and just how far my family had come from literally being migrant pickers to someone finishing a PhD. The stories of my people, of my ancestors, those stories flow through me. It is the sharing of those stories that has opened me up to a world of ecological knowing that mainstream environmental scholarship tends to overlook. Early on in my academic career, most of the environmental scholarship I encountered explicitly or tacitly endorsed the Descartian dualistic view of the human person, an understanding of the self that exists outside of and apart from non-human nature. Uh, I'm sorry, I lost my place here real quick. Yep, uh, I think therefore I am. While this human nature binary existed well before the invention of race, as a concept, race made it much made it such that the boundaries between being human and being a part of nature needed to be policed to preserve the hierarchical status of the human, or more precisely, the white, cisgendered, heterosexual, upper class man. Mainstream environmental scholarship does not explain how the maintenance of the human nature binary is critical for the maintenance of white body supremacy. I use the phrase white body supremacy to draw attention to the ways in which the ideology of white supremacy renders all non-white bodies, be they human or other than human animals, as objects. As such, scholars who do not attend to race and their ecological work, all the while arguing for the elimination of the human nature binary and the subsequent oppressive hierarchies that flow from it, they fail to understand the depth of the challenge they are undertaking. Asking white people to give up their ideological commitment to the human nature binary is in this way similar to asking them to give up whiteness. And we can see how well that is going. Environmental practices are always racialized and racializing practices are always environmental. And yet the majority of white environmental scholars write in such a way that I'm led to believe that they see race as one factor among many that ought to be explored when thinking about the environment. And what I want to suggest to you all today is that one cannot begin to understand ecology and the climate catastrophe we are currently facing without understanding how racism, colonialism, and imperialism have brought us here. These are the most important points of analysis because the ideology of white body supremacy runs deep. As theologian Willie James Jennings notes in his book, A Christian Imagination, Theology and Origin of Race, the idea of whiteness rendered any narrative of self-identity bound to geography, trees, and, or animals as unintelligible. With the emergence of whiteness, identity was calibrated through possession of, and not possession by, specific land. People would henceforth and forever carry the identities of their identities on their bodies without remainder. From the beginning of the colonialist moment, being white placed one at the center of the symbolic and real reordering of space. The idea of race required removing place as the central marker of one's identity and replacing place with the pigmentation of one's body. One could be French, English, Spanish, or Portuguese, but for the idea of race to stick, the landscapes of their white bodies needed to take precedence over the landscapes of their home countries as the primary means of classifying and organizing the human body. By delinking notions of self-identity from landscapes and tying them to human bodies, the idea of race should be understood as both a sociocultural and ecological event. My approach to doing ecology by centering the lives of BIPOC, which stands for Black, Indigenous, and other people of color, by centering BIPOC communities and non-human nature is important because it helps call attention to the inconsistencies and false equivalencies made by environmentalists and activists, environmentalists and activist environmental agencies. And I would like to conclude my talk, or not, I would like to conclude this portion of the talk, I should say, by saying a bit more about one of these false equivalences, the way we use the term Anthropocene. In an article published in the Global Change Newsletter in the year 2000, 
the atmospheric chemical chemist Paul J. Critson and the eco ecologist Eugene F. Stormer suggested that a new epoch should be added to the geological time scale, Anthropocene. In a follow-up essay, Critson goes on to note that in the last three centuries, the Earth is operating in a no analog state. In other words, in his words, the Earth system has recently moved well outside the range of natural variability exhibited over the last over over at least the last half million years. And the nature of change now occurring simultaneously in the Earth's systems, their magnitudes and rates of change are unprecedented and unsustainable. He concludes this essay by moving to the deeper point of both articles on the Anthropocene by arguing for responsible use of environmental resources. Indeed, for one, for one of the pioneers of the term Anthropocene, what we see here is that the term was devised and employed in part to provoke a meaningful response among the public to change their way of life to prevent an environmental catastrophe. So we're presented with a question, what motivates people to change? What motivates societies to change? What makes this change sustainable? Philosophers, theologians, psychologists, and neuroscientists have spent an incalculable amount of time trying to discern answers to these questions. My answer, however, is rather simplistic, but anyone who has recovered from an addiction or knows someone who's recovered from an addiction will be familiar with. Before we can change the thinking that informs our doing, we first have to admit that we have a problem. If we're going to change our habits, we have to be confronted with the concrete reality that the only other alternative to change is death. As it relates to the problem of global climate change, we must recognize that some whom we love, some of our family and friends who also struggle with the same carbon addiction that we do, some of them will choose death rather than change. We must not let those who fail to see the reality of our climate crisis persuade us that choosing death is somehow a sign of strength and bravery. Now, some of you may be wondering, who is this we I keep referring to? Who is this mysterious we that needs to change? I'm going to say a lot more about that in a few minutes. But I begin by saying our ability to answer this question will go a long way in determining if our grandchildren will find this planet habitable. Indeed, if we are going to inspire those responsible for our current ecological crisis to change, we must be very precise about who they are. And this is why the term Anthropocene, while helpful in identifying that humans are shaping our current geological epoch at unprecedented rates, doesn't go far enough in identifying the groups of humans most responsible for our current predicament. The term Anthropocene, I argue, presents us with an illusion of accountability. It is being deployed to obscure and shield those who need to be held accountable for anthropogenic climate change if we are to choose life over death. And make no mistake, this is the choice that we are making. As such, it is urgent that we stop using the term Anthropocene in isolation as a way to passively suggest that all humans are equally responsible for our current climate crisis. Anthropocene can no longer be a means of language evasion where those who are most responsible for our current climate crisis are not explicitly positioned as moral agents and decision makers. This does not mean that we abandon the term Anthropocene altogether. Indeed, for those of us who live in the West or in developed nations, there is merit to using the term regardless of our racialization because all of us have a disproportionate impact on our climate relative to folks in so-called underdeveloped nations. Rather, I suggest that, we, when, that when we use the term Anthropocene in our writing and speaking, we make it clear that certain human groups, predominantly men, Euro-American men, and multinational corporations whose boards are made up of a combination of the two, that they play a disproportionate role in creating our current climate crisis. According to the Climate Accountability Institute, just 20 corporations are responsible for one third of all carbon emissions. Just 100 companies are responsible for 70% of global carbon emissions. If we are going to change our ways, and if the political leadership of our various countries who are predominantly male and operate under the capitalist logic of whiteness is going to be persuaded to change, then we must be confronted with the concrete reality of our role in moving our planet into our current epoch. We must view accountability as a sign of courage rather than weakness, accountability as a sign of wisdom rather than capitulation. In this way, the Anthropocene becomes an opportunity to tell a factual story of how our planet arrived at this point and who is primarily responsible. By identifying a way of thinking that led us to the Anthropocene, we are better equipped to analyze solutions that are proposed to solve our current climate crisis 
If the proposed solution to global climate change does not include an anti-colonial, anti-racist, and anti-sexist agenda as a core component, then we will know that it is merely a modified reproduction of the dehumanizing, colonialist reasoning that has led us thus far. So what do we do? I propose that as people of faith, in dealing with these terms and trying to discern the language that we use and building upon the logic of the Anthropocene, we begin to redefine what it means to be human so that we can use more clear and precise language when we are discussing what it means for us to be human and who we are and our responsibilities as human. So I'm gonna conclude my talk by talking a little bit about what that looks like on practical terms. Since the onset of coloniality, the term human has become a projection of the white fantastic hegemonic imagination. I borrow the term white fantastic hegemonic imagination from Emily Towns um, in her amazing work dealing with um, structures of evil. This understanding of human has rendered the human virtually synonymous with white men in life for its own sake. So on one hand, when you have the Anthropocene, we are talking about human that's understood to be everybody right? Because it doesn't actually hold anybody accountable. But on the other hand, we're talking about the nature of rights and the giving of rights. Human is very limited, right? It becomes very limited in terms of who actually gets to their humanness gets to count. And so what we have is recognizing that as people of faith, I argue that we need to decolonize our assumption of what it means to be human. It, I argue it requires viewing being human as praxis, as a process of learning and unlearning, applying and realizing our humanness in anti-oppressive ways. To be clear, the notion of what it means to be human with respect to human rights, but also with respect to the common vernacular has deeply religious roots. This picture I found that I wanted to show is a picture uh, of, so I wrote down the notes so I wouldn't forget, black protesters marching against school board policies. So these are policies of segregation. Um, they were met by counter protesters. This picture was taken in Memphis, Tennessee in 19, August 31st in 1963, right? So it's right where y'all are from. And you see these signs, right? You see racial intermarriage begins with the holding hands in the first grade. You see a little girl carrying a sign. The Lord made us different for a reason, right? If you look farther down, somebody wrote 6,544 cases of venereal disease among Negroes in Memphis in one year implying that okay that black people are the reason like are somehow dirty or somehow again less human than white folks and so this is the reality that we're inheriting this is the reality that you all are inheriting when it comes to the role religion has played in creating these boundaries of humanness right so religion has played an important role in creating an implicit theological anthropology that has led us to this point to be clear, it's no coincidence that colonialism and chattel slavery emerged during a period when European Christian men were able to claim that Africans and indigenous American people were evil and savage because they were either non-Christian or quote unquote, too close to nature and like animals and therefore distant from God. Theologian Dwight Hopkins refers uh, to, move this out of the way, sorry about this. Um, he refers to this implicit theological anthropology as demonic individualism, and he identifies three parts to it. Historical amnesia. So that's just a collective forgetting of actually what has happened in the past, right? And so it's a reframing of the past in such a way as to make one look like, again, their number one, which feeds into the we're number one mythology, right? So you don't actually have a current awareness of what's happening, or you do what's happening in Florida, where you literally make it almost illegal for people to teach accurate history. And then also instantaneous fulfillment of desires. This idea that society needs to be structured in a way that those who are humans, those who in this sense are white men of a certain class, should be able to have the things that they want when they want them. And so anything that, that, that it limits their ability to have what they want is seen as a threat to their rights, even if it is understood as the compromises one makes in democracy. So this is because being human has been interpreted through the lens of the white racial frame. This is an amazing book by Joe Fegan. I think it's in his third edition. Um, and this is a huge part of our understanding, again, of what it means to be human. The white racial frame is the dominant worldview of Western society, and it encompasses a broad and persisting set of racial stereotypes prejudice, ideologies, and images and interpretations. 
historians and sociologists tend to balance negative comments about white people with comments about good white people during those eras that we are critiquing, right? So during the era of colonialism, during the era of slavery, up to a contemporary era, you have people that write things that critique some problem or some issues that we have with white supremacy, and they feel compelled to balance that by saying things such as, well, this person was a good slave master, or not all white people do this. And to be clear, in my research on plantations, I heard people ask the docents who were leading the tours if the slave masters were good. At the only at one did I not hear them out of the seven plantations that I used for my research. So this is very, very common, right? For people to have these assumptions about that someone could actually be a, a good slave master, right? And to be clear, maybe you're hearing, hearing this and you're like, well, this doesn't apply to me. I would never think like this. Vegan rightly points out, and studies show that even racially liberal whites may reject certain elements of the traditional white racial frame while consciously or unconsciously accepting or highlighting yet others. And so this leads into and builds upon this dominant theological anthropology that we have within the Christian church that's also fed and uh, built upon the logics of social Darwinism. This idea that um, rights should be given to those who are the survival of the fittest. This cartoon, I think, captures it very well where you see um, this is America um, teaching its colon, you know, Cuba, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, and the Philippines. Um, and you see the students in the back that are behaved are American states. You have the Chinese person outside of the classroom, the indigenous person who's reading the book upside down, and the black person who's just allowed in the classroom, but not really civilized, right? And so you have the way in which they're understood to be instructing them what it means to be a proper and civilized society. To be clear, I think liberation theologians and other non-white Christians have critiqued the racism present in our contemporary anthropologies, but I don't know that we sufficiently decolonize our definition of the human. More often, we have argued that we are human too. But as I suggest in my work, being human, ju being just as human as white people, as the way it's constructed, does little to deconstruct the racism, sexism, and ecological attractivist thinking that normalizes oppression. So the implicit, the implicit theological anthropology that we have inherited suggests that we are implicitly taught and socialized to accept an anthropocentric structure of Christianity that places humans as the pinnacle of creation. Racial formation ensures that the human is understood to be white. Patriarchy is that it's male. And heterosexism and ableism ensures that he's able-bodied and straight. When people of color and women strive to be full human beings within this flawed structure, we are striving toward an anti-Christian theological principle that replicates an oppressive hierarchical model that places whiteness, maleness, and able-bodiedness, and heterosexism as the pinnacles of creation. So unless we attend to this theological anthropology, the majority of Christians, whether they be women, people of color, LGBTQ folks, or disabled, or et cetera, and especially Black Christians, are at risk of subscribing to the theological norms that have normalized our exploitation and exploitation of non-human nature. So what can we do? What I suggest in my work is that we need to decolonize what it means to be human, to decolonize, to basically come up with a decolonial theologic anthropology. I constructed mine on three pillars of self-love, solidarity, and holistic interdependence. What makes this anthropology decolonial is that my foundational assumption is that all creation has sacred worth and no created being should be exploited in the eyes of God. I build upon the legacy and power of the creation narratives because they still carry theological weight I'm a person who actually really does, when I say I love the Bible, like I say that with every fiber of my being. Um, and so that, 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 that those stories, I think, inform the way in which I view the world. I'll briefly cover these through, and then we can, um, I'll wrap up so we can move to um, Dr. Harris's talk. The first is self-love. For Black folks, this is crucial because I believe embracing the idea that we're creating the image of God recognizing that we have value can begin to help us heal some of the internal really residue of coloniality, the internalized racism and the dehumanization, and quite honestly, the animalization that our bodies have had to endure. Solidarity is crucial and I think builds upon the work that we see in the life of Christ. But this kind of solidarity, as you can see, isn't modeled after the imagined white Jesus of European art, rather, is built off a first century Palestinian Jew who lived in Roman occupied Palestine, um, recognizing that Jesus fostered these interdependent relationships with people who would be otherwise outcasts. And so that requires us to feel the suffering of the exploited workers and those who are exploited as if it was our own suffering. 
I argue that this solidarity needs to extend to non-human nature and non-human animals as well, especially when the harm is unnecessary for our survival. It looks different for white folks. For white folks, I believe solidarity can really be built off, you know, the writings of Philippians 2, 1 through 11, this notion of self-emptying. I argue self-love begins by mirroring Jesus by emptying oneself of the colonial assumptions that frame your self-understanding, right? What does it mean to think of yourself outside the white racial frame and discover who you are in order to love your actual self rather than a self that's been constructed for you that's in a hierarchical oppressive state? Similarly with solidarity, it requires an amnesis, right? A resistance to the historical amnesia, right? An intentional remembering of the exploited, marginalized and minoritized victims of their historical and ancestral legacy of oppression. To be clear, while white folks now are not at fault for the mistakes, misdeeds, and evil actions of their ancestors, they now bear responsibility of reconciliation so that they may begin to heal from the wounds of the past as well, because in this sense, it's a recognition that we all carry this particular kind of trauma. This isn't easy. As I suggest in the book, I talk about spiritual practices of compassion to help us begin to heal that trauma to turn inward so that those fears, longings, the anger, and the destructive gifts can be used as guideposts so that we can actually move towards working together and internally deal with the trauma of racism that exists latent within white folks as well. And lastly, recognizing that indeed we are actually interdependent, that we need each other, and that we work best as human beings when we work together that we allow the spirit of liberation to work within, persuade, and inspire us so that we can carry out God's mission or the mission of God to care for the earth. To be clear, this way is not egalitarian, but anthropocentric through the lens of Black spirituality that sees all life as sacred, not even nature, is a part of our notion of community. To wrap up, my goal in, in presenting this, this, this brief presentation is to say that we are in a moment of uh, environmental catastrophe and for us to move past this particular moment, it requires us to reimagine what it means to be human. And so that is my invitation to you all today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Reverend Dr. Carter for that really thorough um, insightful presentation. And folks, feel free to Please feel free to give your thoughts and thanks in the chat as well. And for those who are joining us, please do drop your questions in the Q&A feature uh, so we can begin to answer those here after we hear from, from Reverend Dr. Harris. But let me, before I do that, let me make sure that I also introduce Reverend Dr. Melanie Harris. Uh, so Reverend Dr. Melanie L. Harris is, a, is the professor of Black Feminist Thought and Women's Theology, jointly appointed with Wake Forest School of Divinity and the African American Studies Program at Wake Forest University. Reverend Dr. Harris is also the director of the Food, Health, and Ecological Wellbeing Program. Her research and scholarship critically examines intersections between race, religion, gender, and environmental ethics. She's the author of many scholarly articles and books, including Gifts of Virtue, Alice Walker and Womanist Ethics, Ego Womanism, Earth Honoring Faiths, and co editor of Faith, Feminism, and Scholarship, The Next Generation, as well as numerous journal articles and book chapters. Reverend Dr. Harris earned her PhD and MA degrees from Union Theological Seminary in the city of New York, an MDiv from Illiff School of Theology, and a BA from Spelman College. Let's welcome Reverend Dr. Harris, and Reverend Dr. Harris, the floor is now yours. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the beautiful introduction. So grateful to you for being there at Memphis Theological Seminary, and congratulations on the soon-to-be Dr. Ferris Blunt. That's exciting. I am so deeply grateful to the work of Dr. Christopher Carter. Thank you so much for a brilliant presentation and an opening indeed of our minds and our hearts. I am also deeply, deeply grateful to Memphis Theological Seminary for this invitation. It is unique to actually have a team of ecological justice keepers and earth justice keepers uh, invited to such a lecture. So I'm very grateful to you all for having the wisdom and insight to be able to bring Dr. Carter and I together on this night. I do wanna give thanks, especially for the Holmes and uh, Todd lectureship. I am a deep, deep um, daughter of Womanist Thought and therefore have received lots of wisdom from Dr. Barbara Holmes over the years. And so deep, deep gratitude, especially um, to those who have made paths for each of us to be here. We'll begin tonight by entering into a moment of meditation. 
This is an opportunity to engage a bit of contemplative practice such that uh, Barbara Holmes, of course, is really, really well known of um, leading us into, but also really embodying some of these beautiful themes and values that Dr. Carter has set before us in terms of self-love, solidarity, and sacred worth or interdependent inter interdependence. I um, am really grateful to be able to present on eco-womanism, eco-memory, and healing practices. And as I do so, want to invite you indeed to feel, to hear, to listen, and to be fully as you can um, as we are together in this evening. So let me invite you to breathe in deeply and exhale. We'll do this a few times, just re-engaging our minds and bringing that union together with our full bodies. Take a moment just to notice where you are, all the beautiful wisdom and knowledge that's been shared and all the great ideas that are in your mind. And I just wanna invite you to open your mind even more deeply. You might do so by breathing in, and exhaling. We'll take three more deep breaths. Go ahead and breathe out any stale air. When you're ready, take a deep breath in, inhaling very deeply, allow your lungs to fill to the capacity. And when you're ready, you can exhale. Just take a moment to notice here, how is your body? How is your mind? Take a moment to breathe out any stale air. And when you're ready, take a deep breath, inhaling very deeply, the light of hope, of new, of fresh. And when you're ready, you can exhale. Just take a moment to notice here as you come back to a regular breathing pattern. When you're ready, go ahead and engage your breath once more, exhaling any stale air and get ready to take a deep breath, inhaling very deeply, just allowing this newness of space, new this energy of being together to fill yourself with light, to fill your whole core. And when you're ready, you can exhale. Sweet river, deep river, wash over us now. Sweet river, deep river, set us free. Just 
The gift of eco memory and eco poetry has a way of weaving in for us the newness or freshness that allows us to create a kind of energy to sustain our work as activists and as earth keepers in the work of environmental justice. These healing practices come indeed from within the depth of our own spiritualities, our own religiosities, and they are shaped in part by our very nature, the water, that is in us as beings, the sound that is around us and coming through us by the gift of creation and being created, and the ability to be able to be in union, mind, body, spirit. The recognition of the importance of healing practices connected to environmental thought comes not just from this generation, but certainly from eons of thinking and wisdom around how to create ways of life that honor the earth as sacred. The African cosmology that so deeply informs black liberation theology and womanist thought indeed believes and states that there is an interconnection between the divine, the ancestors, earth, nature, and beings, including human beings. That the synergy between all of these realms is what helps to create a healthy, ethical, or moral landscape. That when humans are in good relationship with earth, that God is happy. And that when God and humans are in healthy alignment, the earth thrives. And then when all three realms are connected, indeed, the earth is healthy, humans are happy, and the ancestors are pleased. With this basic cosmology as a frame for eco-womanist thought, it makes sense then that we understand the earth as deeply sacred. I want to share a little bit of a quote with you. So I'll ask for permission here for um, in, or, in order to share my screen, if you can. And Nathan, I think is helping us on the background, just um, helping to create on a way for me to share. Great, thank you so much. And let's see if this will work. Give me one moment here. Very good, thank you so much, thank you. So I want to share just a, a bit of the background for eco-womanism and um, to create indeed an opportunity um, for those of you who are still new to the term to at least be able to uh, keep up with our conversation today. Um, eco-womanism is essentially an approach to earth justice or environmental justice that centers the theological voices, ethical perspectives, and multi-layered analysis of experiences uh, of particularly women of color and especially African and African-American women. So there are ways in which the method itself opens up a kind of conversation around how to create a ways in to becoming healed. The first step in the eco-womanist method is to honor experience. The second step is to reflect on that experience, to really mine the kind of cosmology that might actually be present. So for many women of African descent, it is the case that this kind of African cosmology that we've talked about, this kind of bond and bondedness essentially with the earth um, is a part of how the earth is shaped and the part of where we have a deep connection with the earth. Now this careful reflection is important and critical in nature when we think about particularly African-American women's experiences with the earth. 
as we know from the work of Dolores S. Williams, womanist theologian, who recently transitioned, that there is an eerie similarity to the parallel oppressions between Black women and the earth. It's moving through this kind of critical reflection on experience that we begin to come up with new questions and in some cases begin to name the spaces in which there has been racial and planetary trauma. The third step of the method is to conduct womanist social analysis. So those familiar with womanist methodology know that Katie Cannon indeed uh, was one of the first geniuses to be able to look at this definition coined by Alice Walker, a literary genius, and to really to adopt that term for her as she was moving through the ordination process really in the Presbyterian church, facing remarkable sexism, facing remarkable patriarchy in the tradition. She herself began to think through a way of being a scholar and a preacher that race, class, and gender, these kind of points had to always be taken into account when approaching any issue socially um, and ethically. The fourth step of the method is to critically explore the tradition. And in this case, we actually have lots of opportunity to go back to examine the words, the language that we use in traditional uh, environmental thought, for example, to consider the words and hymns that are used even in the Christian tradition that bifurcate and uh, kind of create a dualism between heaven and earth. This is particularly important in terms of African-American spirituals in part because it is here that we do so see this really, really clear dualistic nature and almost as a cry to be able to get away from the reality of racial oppression and racist uh, race racial trauma. Exploring this um, becomes important in part because of the fifth step, and that's to begin to be open to engaging transformation. This can, kind of transformation is different for different folk. So when we're talking about by POC folk, when we're talking about Black women in particular, the kind of transformation that can happen by moving through the eco-womanist method is essentially being able to see the self whole, to experience the self as earth, as divine, to be able to, for once, see the self outside of the racial context or the traps of white supremacy but to truly begin to engage a kind of transformation that brings one into it, her full form or their full form. This kind of fullness or wholeness is only possible through step six, the gift of being able to share dialogue, to be in conversation, especially for those in religious discourse and religious thought that has been so deeply imprinted upon by Christian uh, Christianity and kind of normative Christian theology, it becomes important in sharing the dialogue to open up the discourse beyond Christian norms, beyond Christian categories, and really taking advantage of the opportunity to engage indigenous religious thought, African, Mexican, uh, indigenous in terms of Indian and even Asian to actually share dialogue beyond the normative religious traditions, putting Christianity and Buddhism, for example, into conversation. The seventh step is to actually take action for justice. And here it is to really protest the logic of domination wherever it is seen, as we have just heard brilliantly from Dr. Carter, even if the logic of domination is lodged in to the language of environmental thought, Anthropocene to protest racial ignorance, to protest white supremacy. And thinking about today's conversation around um, healing practices, I wanted to invite us to take a look again at this remarkable step of sharing dialogue in step six, where we actually find a deep, deep prompting from another recent ancestor, Bell Hooks, an extraordinary cultural critic, an extraordinary black feminist, Bell Hooks was one Black writer who 
originally really discounted religious discourse and did not write about religion at all as helpful in part because she witnessed so many black women harmed by religion. What we know in studying her work and her writing is that indeed Bell Hooks herself came into a different form of practice. Buddhist practice and Christian practice, an amazing kind of sharing of voices between these two lived in her own spirituality and provides insight in terms of some of her own understandings of the importance of self-care and planetary care. I'll read this quote in its fullness. For many years, and even now, generations of Black folks who migrated north to escape life in the South return down home in search of a spiritual nourishment, a healing that was fundamentally connected to reaffirming one's connection to nature, to a contemplative life where one could take time, sit on the porch, walk, fish, and catch lightning bugs. If we think of urban life as a location where Black folks learned to accept a mind-body split that made it possible to abuse the body, we can better understand the growth of nihilism and despair in the Black psyche. And we know that when we talk about healing the psyche, we must also speak about restoring our connection to the natural world. The gift of returning to Bell Hook's work for the conversation of healing practices in this return to eco-memory suggests that there is something spiritual and something sacred, even about us returning to the first step of an eco-womanist method. The first step is to honor one's own experience. Oftentimes in class, when I teach eco-womanism, when I invite students to reflect on this first step, students reflect upon their first encounter with a strawberry or their first encounter with climbing a tree or their first encounter really witnessing the beauty of earth in a backyard or a park or a mountain on a hike. This memory for eco-womanist thought holds power. It is literally the energy of being connected with God, the divine, with earth as divine. Try it. Take a moment, close your eyes if need be, to remember one of the most beautiful spaces you have been in earth. Perhaps it was the beach and the feeling of sand on your feet. Perhaps it was in a field or garden. Perhaps it was feeling the light of sun on your back or skin. Breathe in the beauty of this moment again the gift of being with earth. Isn't that healing? Isn't that power? Isn't that divine? Now imagine that this same energy is what God wants for you, what the ancestors beg you to be present to all of the time. This energy, this union, this communion with earth, this capacity to engage this form of love is a part of, in Buddhist terms, we might call being in tune with Buddha nature. It is indeed an invitation to be fully present in the moment, fully present to the fact that even now in Memphis and in every place, there is air that you're breathing. But there are several pieces of earth that have worked hard to make this possible. 
that it is not just the strength of your lungs or the capacity of your body sitting or standing or lying down, but that earth, earth self has created this moment for you to breathe in. This is energy. This is power. This is healing. Now imagine the tree before you on the screen, the beauty of the sunlight behind it, the colorful leaves at the feet of the tree. You might even imagine all of the roots underneath. This tree is a lynching tree. But we experience in viewing it in this way with these words and this new knowledge is what Kimberly Crin Ruffin calls the birdie, beauty to burden paradox. It is indeed difficult to imagine a hanging body of a black man or black woman from this limb. The reconnection with the environment, the reconnection with trees and ecology becomes very important but difficult for many BIPOC peoples who come from communities whose bodies have been terrorized by the act of white supremacy, logic of domination in using both the tree and a being for racial violence. Who heals the tree, the lynching tree? Who heals the white mob? Who heals the lynched body? So that this return to eco memory that Bell Hooks invites us to is indeed an act of resistance and an act of healing. For Bell Hooks in this time, in this moment, it is not so much that she's concerned about the white psyche, the white mob, but rather the black psyche and their relationship with the earth to go back into eco-memory and to re-engage the healing power of the divine of earth is to also bring us into a moment of true interconnection. We are the tree, the lynching tree. And the tree is us. To suggest this kind of eco-womanist theology may indeed seem counter to Christianity, except for the fact that we have the gift of the work of James Cone, the cross and the lynching tree, in which he problematizes Christianity again, white Christianity particularly, for ignoring the fact that wood comes from trees and that the logic of domination that has built white Christianity has torn down the lives of black people and the life of Jesus. This bond and this understanding of the suffering of Jesus comes easily for many, many black peoples because we know what it has been like to have our blood mingle with the blood of trees, to heal that bond, to reframe that bond, to heal that bond takes a new kind of relationship of care. Black peoples must indeed heal their own relationship with the earth, with even the lynching tree, as we do our work of environmental justice. 
Now, most environmental thought and most environmental movement workers don't always take this into consideration. So that the assumption is that one comes with an ahistorical mind. There ought not be, many say, any work on anti-racism or any confrontation of the logic of domination woven into the environment move, movement in the first place. Bell hooks and the image of this tree would challenge that. It would say that there can be no solidarity without a deep, deep reckoning and a deep, deep remembering of how racial trauma and planetary earth trauma, environmental violence has taken place. It is common now to know that white supremacy is not healthy for black peoples. It is not healthy for communities of color. It is not healthy for the planet. White supremacy is not healthy for the planet. So many black peoples know this and they reject white supremacy and they have rejected different forms of racial reconciliation and instead demanded a true repair. Repairing first themselves. Repairing first our communities preparing our own relationship with the earth. Thank you. Let's make sure to thank Reverend Dr. Harrison and Chad as well for her presentation and she really walked us through that really, really well. Um, and I now want to make sure that we invite uh, our panelists, invite our presenters, Reverend Dr. Harris or Dr. Carter. I'm sure there's some thoughts that you may want to dialogue with each other right now. So now's the time to do that. And again, the folks have, have questions, please do drop those in the Q&A feature as we, as we head towards the end here shortly. We'll make sure to bring those in as well. But first, I want to give you all space to dialogue with one another um, and, and share with them thoughts you might have with one another. Yeah, I think the chat <clears throat> summarizes my feelings of, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, um, you know, I think Dr. Harris, you know, um, your ability to hold a space and particularly to lead those practices is so crucial. Um, and I think it'll, it allows us to lean into everything that leads us to the moment of actually the tree. You know, like you got us to that place where we were ready to have that kind of awareness. Um, and I was just thinking, I mean, there's two things that really stood out to me that I wanted to at least just let you know that, that, that are sitting with me now. You know, when you ask, like, who heals the tree? I was like, you know, <laughs> like, like, who heals the tree? Like, recognizing that this particular kind of trauma we're talking about um, not only impacts, is, impacts the people that's there, but like you said, the planet. And actually asking ourselves, like, this is violence that's done to this particular kind of tree. Who heals that space, right? Uh, I thought that was a powerful question that I had not really thought about um, before you asked. Obviously taking seriously the recognition that not the white mob also needs to be healed. The Black body and the community that that body came from needs to be healed. But that kind of importance of healing of non-human nature as well. Then the other thing, and this is, I guess, maybe more of a question for you, because I think maybe you can even answer it, given, you know, where you're currently located now at Wake Forest. You know, I grew up in a fairly small town. You know, it's only about 40,000 people. Um, but I will tell you, I feel most at home when I go visit my family in Ponchatoula, Louisiana. And y'all don't know where Ponchatoula is because it's really tiny. <laughs> it's very rural. Um and when I would go visit my grandpa in Three Rivers, Michigan, which is a community of 3,000 people. And when we go on vacations and I go to these places where I'm literally the only Black person there, but we're usually in a cabin somewhere. And I realized that my heart is very much tied to rural spaces, but those aren't the spaces that necessarily feel the safest. 
and it's difficult. It is difficult for me, right? Because um, I think that's, you know, that's the challenge that I, that, that, that I find myself in is this recognition that, you know, I also thought of Bell Hooks's book, Belonging, where she talks about that, right? This idea that like you find yourself back, like most of us, our ancestors can trace our lineage back to the agrarian South. Um, and there's something about that space, that openness, that land that is pro- is healing. Um, and and yeah, so that for me is something that I'm still trying to wrestle with. And, and, and I see this in your work as much as anything is what does it mean to go to these spaces and find healing um, when urban spaces that really, uh, you know, have allowed us to lean into that body soul dualism have done us more harm than good. So that's that's a kind of scattered thoughts, but those are the things that really emerged for me. Thank you so much, Dr. Carter. And thank you so much for your presentation. I am so deeply grateful to have such a beautiful co-journer on this journey and grateful for your writing, especially, and the hard work that it has taken to be able to craft a new way of being in in these um, kind of cemented environmental (laughs) movement waters. I'm grateful for your um, skill with language and exceptional writing. It really is transformative and, and one of the gifts I think of your writing is that you weave your writing in a way that so many of us can actually come and be a part of the conversation. I think the observation about the tree is so helpful. Um, I think this is one of the things that I have learned more in engaging um, Native ancestry, particularly Native American ancestry and Cherokee and Blackfoot, um, particularly traditions in recognizing that if for me, uh, my own work and as a womanist ethicist was so deeply shaped by African and African-American culture, um, and in particularly Christian thought um, that it be it took me a minute to recognize I too really wanted to be connected to something bigger than the Christian categories um, and that the earth the climate crisis kind of required me to be um, connected to and to speak in different languages beyond Christianity um, and I I I think it was really indigenous and native voices that you know, ask me the question, well, if you want to do something on eco womanist thought, that's fine. And your concepts are, you know, quite beautiful. But where is the voice of the earth in eco womanism? And here I had been, you know, con- conceptualizing an entire field without actually centering, decentering the human and decentering even, even the Black human um, to be able to hear the wisdom that was actually really coming from earth or self. And so I appreciate the, you know, the kind of um, affirmation of the tree because this is an attempt to create voice um, and at least a space um, for being able to hear the earth. Um, There's a wonderful essay that I wrote uh, based on an experience that I had with the Journal of um, for Feminist Studies of Religion in which I really recognized that um, it is not always the words that need to be spoken that we have to focus on, but it's the, literally the shaping of the ear um, that we also have to work on in terms of being able to hear the earth. And most of us, the scholars certainly, are not actually trained to hear the earth. And so I think this turn towards the in, internal, towards uh, internal reflection, the bell hooks is really prompting us to do in part because of her own religious practice, right, of, of meditation, and in her case, Buddhist meditation, clearly Buddhist meditation. It's um, it helps to open up, I think, her mind as a theorist, but it also helps to open her up to the fact that she belongs to the earth, that the same substance, the same stardust that is in the universe is the same stardust that makes her up, and that that black earth, that brownness that that is sacred. So there's this reframing of blackness and a total reframing of of brown beauty, which is totally contradictory to white supremacist understandings of race and racialization. Um, It lifts up um, brownness and earth in these divine ways, um, which I think is the accurate frame that most peoples of color, particularly those of us who are descendants and have had to, you know, and have to live with the reality 
of racial injustice in our own beings. That's what I think keeps us um, whole. That's hope for us. I I I am challenged too with rural space. I too come from a people. Um, my people are from Mississippi and a very very small town, um, Woodville, Mississippi. And so I too find a deep part of my own root. I find breath and the ability mm -hmm. to breathe there differently than I do in any other city, including New York City. Um, and and I love New York. Um, but there is a way in which I am deeply connected there. And because it is in the South and my parents grew up in Jim and Jane, Jane Crow, I know that um, the stench of racism is also so thick in that air. And it's thick enough to interrupt a moment of beauty for me if I don't have a number of people walking with me um, and people who basically have my back. And so that's one practice that I have found, which is a very simple practice, but it is to bring community with you so that you can commune. No, I think that's, I mean, that's it's beautiful. And I mean, I'm still fortunate that, um, you know, the majority of my family still lives there. I mean, they live in Michigan. What's my mom's side of family. My dad's side of family is in Louisiana. Um, and so I have the ability to be in that space and be in community. And that does, I mean, my wife, the first time we went down after we were married, um, she talked about how relaxed I was. And she was like, you are fundamentally different here than you are back home. Um, and I hadn't really noticed it. Um, the last thing I'll say before we open it up to, to Q&A, um, I think this tying to place, I want to note <clears throat> Willie Jennings' work here because I think it's helpful for all of us, particularly those of you who are not Black. Um, because he really talks about the the, the 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 tragedy of whiteness is that it delinked you from place. That place as an identity marker was crucial for an understanding of who you are, right? And so, like, you couldn't be French, Spanish, or German, or whatever. Like, you know, that became secondary to your physical appearance of whiteness, and 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 in so doing, it delinked you from the landscapes of your identity. Right. And and that has robbed, I mean, that is a kind of trauma that has robbed white folks of the ability to actually move to, to see whiteness as the falsification that it is. Right. And that is that's one that to me is, is one of the fundamental challenges that we have when we're doing this work or anti-racist work is presenting people of people who are not people of color, right? White people, an alternative conception of what it means to not only be human, but an alternative conception of what it means to embody a sense of self outside of you know the white racial frame um and it is difficult and so i want to be clear like i know uh, I'm, i can't tell who's all here but i don't know what you understand like this is i recognize the challenge of this that we all face black people face this too because of the structural nature of white supremacy and this is why i like to use the language of trauma because it recognizes that we're all wrapped up in this trauma like this is a traumatic for all people, including nature. Like you said, with the tree, when you said that, I was like, it's like, no, this is, but you mean all, you're talking about the whole biotic community. So anyway, thank you so much. Um, this is amazing. I know we have some questions in the Q&A, so I'll make sure we get to those. Um, so I'll turn it over to you, Ferris. Absolutely. So actually the first question for you, Reverend Dr. Carter, uh, someone's asked, some people of various native tribes express that if we quote, respect the earth, we will respect each other. What are your reflections on that on that statement? I'm going to say something briefly and then toss this to Dr. Harris. This feels like a question that's more for her. My my inclination, and so I would say my my uh, my move towards um, what might say contemplative spirituality has been greatly influenced by the work of Howard Thurman as a mystic, and that deeply shapes how I engage contemplative practices. That in Roman Roman Catholicism, quite honestly particularly Ignatian contemplative practices. And so my recognition of the sacredness of the earth really has emerged from spent, not only spending time in nature, but recognizing the, again, what I call holistic interdependence. And so I, I fundamentally believe that to be true that when you say something like when you respect the earth, you respect each other, it recognizes that we are the earth, right? <laughs> like that's all it is. That you recognize that we are the earth. Like it starts with that fundamental assumption as opposed to this kind of hierarchical assumption that human beings often have. Um, particularly, you know, people in North America, you know, structured through this particular kind of uh, notion of the human. Um, and so to me, that 
feels right, but it starts with a fundamental assumption of a kind of recognition that we are the earth rather than seeing ourselves as above the earth. Dr. Harris, is there anything you want to add to that? That is brilliant. That's exactly how I would answer. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you can stay right up on up, up on the stage, Dr. Harris, because the next question is tree had a lot of people thinking about this tree that you brought up in your conversation. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna combine the next two questions because they're they're related. So people are asking, number one, how can you speak more, Dr. Harris, to how we are the tree? And then could you second secondly speak to what would you say, who would you say rather heals the tree? So how are we the tree? And then who would you say heals the tree? Is it more of an internal intentional desire to change what the perspective of the tree represents? So again, who, who, how are we the tree? Who would you say heals the tree? Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful flow of thought. I, I think this is an echo of what Dr. Carter was just saying that we are earth. Um, and in that sense, we are the tree and in terms of the kind of makeup of who we are. So if you think in a, you know, kind of basic kind of Christian ritual sense of earth to earth, um, dust to dust, ashes to ashes, we are made of the same stuff. Um, and if we can honor that stuff in us, if we actually see that stuff in us and not the Mac makeup or the earrings or the, you know, suit top or the, um, red bottoms, or if we can honor actually the stuffness of who we are, the beingness of who we are, then there is a way in which I think we are actually able, one, to slow down and to breathe and to recognize the sacred gift that we've been given, um, and also to, to be with one another, to see each, each other. And there's, you know, a beautiful word and I, I am indebted to the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference for reminding all of the, us about this word saubana. And it is this way, of, it's a greeting really um, coming out of African traditional life of being able to say, I see you, I recognize you. And it's not just, hey, how you doing? It's actually this um, deep greeting of being able to say, I see the earthness in you. I see the sacred divine in you. I see the fullness of who you are. And I honor that. Um, and these kinds of communal ways of being are not just African, right? There are ways, but I think there are ways in which we can all, regardless of our race, regardless of the crazy, you know, racial violent culture in the United States of America, we can push ourselves to be able to see the fullness of who we are and, and the fullness of each other. Now, as Dr. Carter mentioned, this is harder work for white folks than they may realize. And so in a lot of the anti-racist work that I do, that you know the kind of eco-memory, the first step of the eco-womanist um, method is, is actually a kind of reckoning with the DNA that's inside of a traditional kind of normal white person in America, which usually isn't too many generations away from some kind of um, plantation life, particularly if you're talking about people in the South. Um, ownership of slaves. And so the, there's a deep kind of work that has to be done by a lot of white people in order to be able to uncover the self. And, and this, I think, is crucial. This is a crucial in terms of the work of actually dis dismantling whiteness and, and being able to be able to honestly see the self and then also to actually be able to see another being. Um, and it's not to say that this is, you know, just just a, I don't want to create a, a racial hierarchy or a binary, black, white binary, which is easy to do. Um, Alice Walker's work is really helpful here. I think that it's it's her work that's helped a lot of people recognize that both the oppressed and the oppressor live in her veins. She's part white, part African-American, and part and many African Americans share that and that ancestry, that DNA, in part because of the sexual violence that was done by so many white slave owners of Black enslaved women. And so those lineages inside of her, she writes about healing those by doing practices, by actually doing the work of racial justice, by being in tune with the fact that her ancestors um, will be at better peace basically, um, by the work that she does in trying to heal and be about justice, even in her own lifetime. 
Uh, thank you so much for the for the, those comments. I think the next question that you all might both be able to to really speak to and, and process through. There she there she is there she is. <laughs> um, someone shared my experience with the environmental movement. It has been very white. Why do you think this has been the case, and how might this change in the future? Hmm. Yeah, there's a a few things I want to say here, um, and so this is Isaiah. For those of you who who are here, my wife is a veterinarian and she unfortunately had to go back to work to do some surgery which is what happens when you have someone in the medical field so uh here we are uh but um i think this is just two reasons why i want to point to this and and i would say like for an excellent summary of this uh, i want to point to um cones james cones article brief article called whose earth is it anyway super helpful i think in terms of clarifying it but in brief, I think some of the bigger issues contemporarily are around the kind of language that's often used by environmental activists, often languages that tries to equate the suffering of the planet and the suffering of non-human nature and animals as kind of the same as suffering of Black folks. And so then Black people can feel as though their suffering isn't being taken seriously. And what I want to suggest is there has to be a recognition that these are very different sufferings, but they still are sufferings, right? They need not be the same to know that suffering does matter. And so what comes at often, what's experienced by Black people is the dismissal of Black suffering for the elevation of planetary life. And so that, by its very nature, can push Black folks away from these kind of organizations. At the same time, these organizations often are more about, um, and I think, um, uh the the dr ruffin in her in her work i think mentions this as well um i know um dr Ashu, you mentioned her before uh the ways in which the language of those organizations are often around i shouldn't say language the goals of those organizations are usually around like the preservation of land or the preservation of kind of of national parks and again i mentioned it in the chat national park i love national parks um but it's more about it can be more about that than necessarily about environmental what we will call environmental justice, right? Um, and and that's in the makeup of their boards, in the makeup of these organizations. They're more about going camping and going hiking and going fishing, and those things are great. But the communities, are, the the way environmentalism, I would argue, is important for people of color at a per present moment is because we're dealing with the ecological catastrophe of climate change. And this is both a racial issue and a class issue, right? Like when I drive, when I go to, to Pontchartula, which is just North Louisiana, and I drive down River Road, you see these communities that are predominantly black. There's plenty of white folks there. <laughs> like it's just, it's poor people. And they all have all kinds of cancers and everything else because of what's being dumped in the Mississippi. And so I think it's a combination of those two things, both the language and then the ways in which people see the land as something we should use, like, go vacation in rather than that we live in it, right? And again, this goes back to Dr. Harris, right? That we are we are the earth. <laughs> and that that doesn't necessarily, I think, influence their thinking. Um, and so that, that I think, I, and I think it can change by changing the constitution of those organizations, right? In terms of who makes up those boards, their the goals that they have, and to have some internal accountability to recognize the role they played in enabling some of the, environmental laws that have passed by supporting some unjust laws, as as um, King would say. Um, I think it can change, but it, it is going to be difficult. Um, and I'll, I'll put a, a book in the ch in the chat. Um, I think it's Dorsetta Taylor, who's done so much research. And like these organizations will say, oh, we want to do the right thing. And then when it comes down to it, they still fall back on doing the stuff that they've been doing. And so some of this is probably going to be funding, I guess is the last thing I'll say. Like funders have to realize, OK, we want to hold institutions accountable to actually do the thing they say they're going to do. Agreed. That's great. One of the most brilliant minds here, people on the earth. I'm so excited. <laughs> I like. I think it's. I'm, I'm still close. I'm still close enough to like my uh, quals and dissertation. So all those, all those books are like just sitting somewhere right in the back of my head. So I know Ferris what I'm talking about. So I'm like, it's, it's right there. Very well. <laughs> I think we probably have time for about one or two more questions. So I'll, I'll ask the last one that's actually in the Q and A right here. Um, it's kind of dovetails to, to the previous one. Can ecological reconciliation be accomplished without decolonization being at the forefront of a new attitude toward accountability? So again, 
Can ecological re reconciliation be accomplished without decolonization being at the forefront of a new attitude toward accountability? So I want to, I, I have an answer, obviously, but I, I want to, I'm going to be cautious in terms of how I answer this. My, because my instincts are to say no, in part because so much of our, the, the, the challenges that we are confronting with in our current ecological era are our remnants of colonialism, right? Like it's a product of colonialism. Like you can really trace the roots of colonialism down to, you know, England's addiction to sugar, <laughs> really, like a literal addiction to sugar and desire for land. Um, and, and, and those really are some of the orienting factors because colonialism is so tied and so, it's so wrapped up with our current ecological extractivist way of being, it's difficult for me to see how decolonization won't be an essential aspect of, of a new attitude, uh, not only towards accountability, but towards a, an, a, a vision of, again, like I said, what it means to be human. Um, what I mean when I'm talking about um, coloniality or decolonization, it, I should say it's really about putting institutions at the service of life rather than life being at the service of institutions. You know, I mean, so, I mean, that, that sounds simple, but if you think about the ways in which our work lives are oriented and all, <laughs> we are much, we are oriented in, in this country to serve institutions rather than institutions serve us. Um, and that's a fundamental shift. And that requires a radical reorientation of our values of what we actually value. Um, and this is something I've talked to Dr. Harris quite a bit about in part because you saw Isaiah, like, so I'm an older dad blessed Isaiah's by any, what, what I would call a literal, a literal miracle. Um, and it required a radical reorientation of my life. <laughs> like it, it, it required a radical, and, and like, uh, it, and so it, and, and, and it, I, I use that as, as, as an example to say like, these kinds of reorientations are very much possible, but it takes a recognition that we are going to, and maybe the word I want to use is like, there's going to be some loss in terms of what the privileges we have as Americans, especially, right? You're talking about outside of race as Americans, because so much of our economic power and the privileges we have are, are based upon our, the, the, the um, structure of the geopolitical sphere. And if that shifts and that changes, um, that means we are going to have to give some things up or things are going to cost more. But that ultimately is what needs to happen for us to actually survive as a species. Um, and so no, I, I guess I can't envision it, but what I can envision is, you know, creating alternative ways of us to not only eat and produce energy and to live that are much more locally sustainable and at the service of life. Um, but that requires commitment from all folks um, to really go about doing that work on a local level and moving outwards. Um, so that's such a great, great question, Milo. So, so thank you for asking that. Yeah, it's a great question. I agree. I agree so much with what Dr. Carter has shared. I would actually um, prompt the questioner to consider the language of ecological reparations mm -hmm. instead of uh, reconciliation and move away from the reconciliation model and really uh, shift even, you know, the kind of theological frameworks that would need to shift with the term reparations and the meaning of that, particularly for Christian communities, what might it mean to really walk into a space of repair and repentance? And I think in that moment of repentance, one can actually come into deep knowing of that loss, but also a knowing of going back to a ritual in order to be able to go through the loss. And that's what Christian communities, I think, all over need to be really practicing. How do we lament? Not just the life of Tyree Nichols, not just the community in Memphis. How do we lament pieces of ourselves, pieces of the earth? Because that lament is going to need to be practiced. That muscle of loss is going to need to be practiced for the climate reality that we're headed in. Um, even if things are not as bleak as they seem, we will still need to know how to lose and keep on. 
No, so thanks so much, uh, Reverend Dr. Harris. I think that's actually a great way as we try to, to head to the close right now to, in our conversation this evening that how do we lament, how do we repent, and how do we repair, right, as we try to do the work of sustaining our lives together on this earth uh, while we're here. So can we tell uh, our panelists, our, our speakers tonight, again, a hearty, hearty thank you for the wonderful work they share with us tonight. I know that folks are busy, have a lot going on, but we thank God for Zoom and thank God for their ability to be available tonight. But can we thank them again in the chat, give them a hearty thanks in the chat. I just wanna share a few kind of final brief notes with, with folks as we close out tonight. Uh, number one, as, as, as Dean Gacky shared with us tonight as we opened up, this is the next lecture, our lecture series. We have some upcoming lectures as well. On March the 27th and March 29th, our very own Dr. Mary Lynn Hudson will be sharing with us uh, via the Bowen lecture. So, so MTS community, please do market calendars for that. And as we continue on this conversation around ecology, the environment, climate change, and theology, there's other two opportunities for folks. If they're interested, we want to make sure that you're aware of. In the fall, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a very strong chance that in the fall, we'll be offering a creation care and community engagement class at MTS. So for those that want to continue the conversation, dialogue, read, process together, look forward in the fall of 2023, a class on creation care and community engagement led by some of our very own faculty members. And then for folks who are looking to say this stuff more deeply as a doctorate student, as a DMIN student, we have a, we have a track, we have a cohort in our DMIN program in a, called Land, Food, and Faith Formation that, that our very own Nathan can also give witness to as well. So if you're a DMIN student that loves, loves the land, loves faith, loves food, and how those all intersect together, we invite you to apply today, be in touch with us today about that program. And Nathan's actually shared in the chat there a link to more information. So again, thank you all so much for being with us tonight. Um, we, we pray you have a wonderful evening, a restful evening. And again, can we thank our panelists as we head on out from this space this evening. Everyone have a great, great night. And we pray you see our next gathering here in the virtual space. Take care, everybody. <laughs>